الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وفقها في الدين يا رب العالمين اللهم افتح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك يا رب العالمين We uh, have been studying the life of Imam uh, Shafi'i rahimahullah and uh, to uh, summarize what we uh, stopped in last time we were studying his time the groups uh, that were uh, active at the time of Imam Shafi'i and namely uh, the uh, Shia al-Khawarij and al-Mu'tazila the Mu'tazilite and we have studied those groups briefly but uh, when we got uh, got to the point Uh, to know the Imam's uh, opinions about these groups, uh, we uh, we were running out of time. So, um, I have a little technical problem here. Okay. And just to briefly summarize these groups, the Shia are the uh, they started with the supporters of Ali radiAllahu an. And then they started a, a sect of the Muslim Aqeedah, and we studied how they were among themselves. They were different; uh, into, uh, they, dif- they uh, deviated into many groups: Shia al kaysaniyya Zaydiyya, Imamiyya, and al Ismailiyya. And uh, the uh, al Khawarij, who had their own interpretation of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam without going back to the scholars, without going back to the Sahaba, they, they uh, went out of the army of Ali radiallahu anh, and there was none, one Sahabi among them, yet they felt that they understood the Qur'an better than the Sahaba, and they would fight the Sahaba on their understanding of the Qur'an. And you have the Mu'tazila, who depended mostly on philosophy and understanding. They wanted, they started as actually defenders of the Aqidah, against uh, the philosophy, the Greek philosophy, and many of the philosophers and the heretics uh, and, uh, of their time. And in that, they try to play uh, the same tone that those other groups are playing and try to learn philosophy and uh, surpass these groups and try to conform Islam into philosophy. And what did not conform in their mind, they rejected. And that's when these groups went astray. So when they were started uh, to uh, defend Islam against Al-Mushabbiha, who, who said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Allah said, uh, Yadu Allahi fawqa aydihim, the hand of Allah is over their hands, they said that the hand of Allah is, is a hand. And the Mu'tazila, uh, instead of saying like the people of the Sunnah, we say the hand of Allah, is that Allah has a hand because he told us he has one. It, we don't know what it is. We believe that Allah has a hand because He said so in the Quran. And Laysa Kamithlihi Shay, there is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe in it, we don't ask what it is and how it is. The Mu'tazila said to reply against those people, instead of saying that what the people of the Sunnah said, they start playing philosophy, they said it's just a symbol of power. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he is, there is nothing like him, he does not have a hand. And then they went further. And they said, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to actually speak, the mushabbi has said, Allah to speak, he has to have a tongue. He has to have lips. He has to have vocal cords. And the Mu'tazila said, no, Allah, not like that. And Allah does not speak. So they said, the Quran is not the words, of, not the speech of Allah, it is a creature, a Quran makhluq. And that's, this is the philosophy of them. Instead of saying, no, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks because he said that in the Quran. وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا Allah spoke to Musa. Certainly. That's in the Quran. And, and we don't know how. And it's not our job to know how. We believe in it as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us so. They would not. They would say that this is not a property of Allah. Speech is property of human beings. And Allah does not speak. There, there, therefore, the Qur'an is a creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and that may be just, uh, may sound like just the playing of words and semantics and philosophy for us, but that was a tribulation that lasted more than 100 years. 
It consumes the terrains of three khulafa, and many of the scholars fell victims to it. Either they were imprisoned, or some of them were murdered and tortured to death because of their refusal to believe in this nonsense, and that philosophy of the Mu'tazila. So to get really to uh, our interest in that is the opinions of Imam Shafi'i in these, uh, for these things. And Imam Shafi'i, uh, basically, uh, because this depended on philosophy, Imam Shafi'i really did not like philosophy, and they did not pe- like to, for people to indulge into philosophical views. He won, he, his, his preach was for us to learn Islam, to learn our religion, forget about trying to really uh, beat them at their game try to learn philosophy and try to do that. And he hated this. And philosophy in the, at that time was known as ilm al-kalam, the, the, the uh, knowledge of speech. So if you see that in the references, that, that's what it means. And, and he said, a uh, very famous quote, he said, حكمي في أصحاب الكلام أن يضربوا بالجريد ويحملوا على الإبل منكسين وهذا جزاء من ترك الكتابة والكتابة والسنة وأخذ في الكلام He said, my ruling in them is they should, should be beaten and should be exposed on the backs of the camel and, and the people should know their faults because they left the book of Allah, they left the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and they just got busy in this arguments and discussions and philosophy of nonsense and that get them deviated. And then when he was asked, why would you not uh, you know, respect that, why would you not encourage people who could be competent in this? He said, رَأَيْتُ أَهْلَ الْكَلَامِ يُكَفِّرُ بَعْضَهُمْ بَعْضًا ورأيت أهل الحديث يخطئ بعضهم بعضا والتخطئة أهون من الكفر. He said the people of philosophy when they discuss with each other when they have, go into arguments they one of them can slip into kufr into rejection into going out of the milla and they call each other kafir. While the people of hadith and fiqh they say the other made a mistake and mistake is is much easier than actually kufr than to go out of the milla of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. But the scholars emphasized that Imam Shafi'i knew ilm al-kalam, he knew philosophy. He would not criticize it and ask people not to do this if he had no knowledge of it. He actually knew it, but he advised against indulging in that. What do we learn from that? Is we really first have to learn our religion. Before many people get uh, enthous- get really keen on trying to uh, discuss with groups like, for example, Christians, and then trying to go to the Bible to see what the Bible said about that and what the Bible said about this and, and all of this. And while they really neglect learning Islam into the core, and our first uh, first really ob- object, our first goal really is to learn Islam well. And those people who study com- comparative religions are specialized in that and they study Islam very well before they go on and study other religions. So that is really a lesson to take from that, uh, from the advice of Imam Shafi. Uh, the other thing is his opinion about the Imama, about the, the concept of the Shia. Imam Shafi'i believed that uh, the Imama, the leadership for the Muslim community, especially the early Muslim community of his time, uh, is, is in Quraysh. Uh, it has to be in Quraysh unless Quraysh could not uh, take the burden of this uh, leadership, then it can go outside. And he did not uh, put being uh, in the clan of Bani Hashim as a condition. Because some other uh, imam said, you have not only to be from Quraysh, you have to be from the clan of Bani Hashim where the Prophet wasallam is. However, he uh, did respect Imam Ali, but he put him in order, uh, in rank with the other khulafa. So he placed first Abu Bakr Siddiq. And he believed that Abu Bakr Siddiq at the time when he got his Khilafah, he was more worthy of, for the Khilafah than Ali radiallahu anh. And he had two evidence for that. This is all the actual opinion of Imam Shafi'i. Number one, when, the, when a woman came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from outside Medina and asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a question. And then uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told her to come back for uh, another, t- another time. And she said, what if I come back and I don't find you? What if I don't find you? And she meant, what if you pass when I'm gone? And then he said, Fati Abu Bakr. Then go to Abu Bakr. And that is a clear 
indication from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is if you don't find me, you find my successor Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu an. And then another hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, and this is a hadith that the Shafi'i himself narrated. He said, "Iqtadu biladina min baadi Abu Bakr wa Umar." Yeah, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Follow those those after me, Abu Bakr and Umar." So he put those people in order. He said, "Abu Bakr first, Umar second, Uthman third, and Ali fourth. Although he was, when he goes into the conflict between Ali radiyallahu an and Muawiyah, he clearly favors Ali radiyallahu an over Muawiyah, and he consider the group of Muawiyah al fiatul baghiyah and he extrapolated the entire hukum of baghi, of transgression when it comes uh, among Muslims, from that particular, from what happened between Ali and Muawiyah. So he believed that both are believers, both had sahaba in their ranks, they're both mu'min, they're both Muslims, however the group of Muawiyah, baghat, they transgressed over the group of Ali, and the right was with Ali in that particular conflict, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. Yet he clearly favored uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib and the progeny of Ali and the progeny of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until he was accused that he was a Shi'i, that he was a Rafidi. And we studied how he you know, said this, uh, uh, that poem, he said, إِنْ كَانَ رَفْضًا حُبُّ آلِ مُحَمَّدٍ فَلْيَشْهَدِ الثَّقَلَانِ أَنِّي رَافِضِي if it is, uh, if, it, if you, I will be accused to be a Rafidi or a Shi'i because I love the house of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then let the entire world call me Rafidi, call me Shi'i. And he loves the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yet he knew the rank of Abu Bakr, rank of Umar, rank of Uthman, and he did not denounce or deny their Khilafah. And uh, he uh, loved Ali radiallahu anhu, and w- one of the things that he said about Ali radiallahu anhu, he said there were four traits in Ali radiallahu an and, and it, each one of them make him uh, does not care what anybody else say about that particular person because Imam Ali was accused and people would say uh, one man told Imam Shafi'i he said he said people did not gather around Ali we know in the last period of Imam Ali's life when he was in Kufa his Shia, the people around him, were dispersed and they would not go with him and, and he did not have enough force to continue his struggle for this ummah. And, and this man said this because he didn't care about others. And Imam Shafi'i said he had four traits that in, in, if only one of them was in, in a man, he would not care about anybody else. First, he was a Zahid. He had this Asiatic life. He, was, he did not care about dunya. So the, the Zahid does not care about the dunya and the people of dunya. وَكَانَ عَالِمًا And he was a scholar. Imam Ali was a, a faqih. He was a jurist. He said, وَكَانَ عَالِمًا وَالْعَالِمُ لَا يُبَالِي لِأَحَدٍ And a jurist and an alim scholar does not care about anybody else because he knows what he has. وَكَانَ شُجَاعًا And Imam Ali was brave. He was known for his courage. وَالشُجَاعُ لَا يُبَالِي لِأَحَدٍ and, and, and a brave, courageous man does not care about anybody else. وَكَانَ شَرِيفًا And he was honorable. وَالشَّرِيفُ لَا يُبَالِ He was noble, honorable person. And that he should not... Doesn't mean doesn't care, he doesn't feel for them. This the translation may be wrong. He doesn't care if they agree or disagree as long as he's on the right path. He, did not, he didn't have to uh, persuade others to follow him. He didn't have uh, to go out of his way to play politics. That's what it means. Muawiyah was a politician by, you know, radiallahu anhu. He was a sahabi, you know. But he knew the politics, how to get people, how to get uh, the tribes around him. Ali was accused that he didn't know politics. And that's what Imam Shafi'i said. He had four traits. And if these four traits weren't anybody, he would not have to play politics. That he was a zahid. That he was a alim. He was a scholar. That he was a brave man and he was an honorable man. And somebody with these traits does not play politics. That's the meaning of that quotation from Imam al-Shafi'i. So with that, uh, and, and this really belongs to the last session, this, this part, we uh, cover the uh, fourth and the last session of our study of Imam al-Shafi'i, and that is the jurisprudence, the school of Imam al-Shafi'i. And Imam al-Shafi'i in the, in the knowledge of jurisprudence, fi ilm al-fiqah, is one of the most important figures, not because he is an, only because he's an imam 
of the uh, of one of the four schools of fiqh but because he is really the founder of usul al-fiqh the the knowledge of basics of jurisprudence imam al-shafi'i is considered the father not one of the fathers the father of that particular knowledge and we will see how that went imam al-shafi'i went through stages in forming his school and that is really important to understand because imam al-shafi'i had uh, different types of fiqh through his life and his uh, fiqh was dynamic his jurisprudence was not stagnant was not static it was dynamic and it changed with these stages of his life the the learning stages of his life there were mostly the medina period where where lasted and there is difference in opinion it lasted about 10 years and it ended in 179 after the hijra of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the concentration of imam al-shafi'i in that period was to learn the maliki fiqh and he learned it from nobody other than no one other than imam malik himself he stood at the feet he he sat there for 10 years at the feet of imam malik and he got the knowledge of imam malik then the second important stage in learning in learning uh, the fiqh was the iraqi period where he was in baghdad for 2 years and in these two years between 184 and 186 he was a student of imam muhammad ibn al hasan who was the most important student of if, you know one of the most important students of imam abu hanifa he wrote the six books of fiqh al hanafi is imam muhammad ibn al hasan and imam al shafi'i narrated these books on imam muhammad ibn al hasan himself and he studied fiqh al hanafi with him so you see he these are the two major schools before his school Uh, the fiqh al-hanafi and the fiqh al-maliki and he learned them very well and he learned and learned them from the source of these schools then imam al-shafi'i started forming his own school and and there is almost no difference in opinion about that started in mecca when he went back to mecca in year 186 and he had his own halaqa and he had his own university his own school he started forming the basics of the shafi'i school and that was in mecca then he went to al iraq in 195 and he stayed there for four years and that was the iraqi stage we will speak a little bit about the traits and the character characteristics of each particular stage then the last stage when he moved to, to egypt when he moved to masr 199 until his death rahimahullah in 204 now each stage had different characteristic main activities when imam al-shafi'i worked on specific things and he produced a book he produced a, 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 a something to really summarize what he did uh, in that particular time imam al-shafi'i in the first stage in Madi- in mecca between 186 and 195 Uh, which lasted about nine years he studied al kulliyat wal usul he put the basics of fiqh he put the general uh, basics the 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 usul the foundation of this ilm now before imam shafi'i the ibma the scholars before him would would give rulings would have characteristics of their schools but there are no met- clear methods of how they uh, concluded how they extrapolated Imam al-Shafi'i I mean they knew how, what they were doing but there was no book you can go to to see how the Hanafi how Imam Abu Hanifa did it Imam al-Shafi'i started putting those foundations those methodology and in that particular time of his life he almost he perfected that knowledge he put the, this knowledge of usul al-fiqh and he, that's why he is considered as the father of this particular uh, knowledge and in there he wrote a very important book in our history and that is in the book of ar-risala book ar-risala risala basically risala means the letter uh, and what it is it's one of his students is abdul rahman ibn mahdi asked imam shah he said i want i want to know the, the the method of how you do this and how you, i don't want the the answer he didn't want answer to a certain problem he wanted the method he wants the key He doesn't want him to open one lock at a time he wants him to give him the key to open the locks for fiqh and Imam Shafi'i wrote a book wrote a risala and sent it back to Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi and this um, according to most scholars this risala was written in Mecca it was not released in Mecca it was released when he was in Baghdad so that's when you see in some references that uh, it was a Baghdadi it was a Iraqi 
uh, book that, but most scholars say, most historians say that it was actually written in Mecca and it was sent to Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi and Imam Shafi'i completed writing the book of Ar Risala in Mecca. The second stage of his thuqa is the Iraqi period, which lasted from 195 to 199. And in there he started studying the details, al furu' the branches of thuqa and weighing the proofs, which one is more uh, authentic, which one is more solid, started forming the details of his school. And his school took its actual shape in that particular period, and he wrote a book, a volume called Al-Hujjah, and that is the, the fruit of that particular time. And the, the, uh, the, the, what he produced in that time is called Al-Fiqh Al-Qadim, the old school of Imam Shafi'i. The old school of Imam Shafi'i was produced in, in Iraq, in Baghdad, between 195 and 199 of the Hijra. Why is it called old school? Because when Imam Shafi'i moved from Baghdad to Mosul, to Egypt in 199, he reviewed, he reviewed what he had, and he uh, changed his mind on a few things, and he modified other things, and this is called the stage of ta'deel wa tamhis, the reviewing and revision. He revised a few things and he reviewed his school and he came up with the last version, if you will. We're now in the age of software, so we have versions for stuff. But this is the this is al fiqh al jadid of al Imam al Shafi'i, the uh, new fiqh of Imam al Shafi'i, and in there he wrote one of the most important books in jurisprudence and in fiqh al Shafi'i. Now al Risala. It's not, also, it's not only important in the fuqh shafii It's important for all students of jurisprudence, all students of fuqh. It is the foundation of fuqh. But Al-Um is the most important book in the fuqh shafii in the fuqh shafii itself. And he wrote that book uh, or revised it in Egypt. Many people said that um, the, um, the book of Al-Um was written in Iraq and it was reviewed and revised in Egypt. But the final version of that particular book came out in Egypt. Now, the, the students of an Imam Shafi'i, we say that each madhab, each school really lives or, or dies based on how active and how uh, diligent the students are. We know there are 13 schools of fiqh that were that all fiqh of Sunnah. We're not talking about Ibadiyya, Azariqa, we're not talking about Imamiyya. We're talking about 13 schools of the fiqh as Sunni, like uh, the, the school of Imam al Layth ibn Sa'id, uh, the fiqh of Imam al Awza'i, the fiqh of uh, Imam uh, ibn Buway, many other, uh, you know, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, others. There were 13 schools, and of those, uh, they, the only surviving ones were four. And many uh, historians said it is because of the students. The students are, are the ones that carry the school, carry the madhab into the next level and establish that particular madhab. So that's why it's important to mention some of the uh, students of Imam Ahmed that were well known. One of them was an Imam, Imam Ahmed. Of Imam Shafi'i, one of the most important students probably of Imam Shafi'i is Imam Ahmed. However, when you actually study the uh, ulama, al-fiqh al shafii when you study the scholars, fiqh shafii of course Imam Ahmed will not be mentioned because he had a school on his own. So he was not a shafii but he was a, a student of Imam al-Shafi'i. There was al-Imam al-Za'farani. Al-Imam al-Za'farani was known of being one of the most eloquent people in Arabic. We know how Imam al-Shafi'i was, was, was a master of Arabic language, was master of linguistic. Imam Zafarani took that from him and he excelled in that. And Imam Zafarani was not an Arab. So you, you see that, that you don't have to actually, uh, to really learn the knowledge and the, and the essentials of Arabic language. The, the one that, most, that excelled most in that was Imam Zafarani and he was not an Arab. Another one is Imam uh, Al-Karabisi. And Imam Al-Karabisi, uh, he uh, also uh, was one of the students of Imam Shafi'i and one of the students of Imam Zafarani that we mentioned. However, the three more, the three important uh, students of Imam Shafi'i that played pivotal role in the madhab itself and the school itself was Al Imam Al Buwaitli, Al Imam Al Muzni, and Imam Al Rabi' Ibn Sulaiman. You cannot study Fuqah Shafi'i without having one of these uh, three names. And uh, Imam Al Buwaitli. 
uh, we start with him. Abu Ya'qub al-Buwaiti, he is uh, the one that is actually, uh, most historians give him credit into collecting and establishing the book of Al-Um. Al-Um is the, the essential book in Fuqh al-Shafi'i. And Imam al-Buwaiti is the one that collected it and gave it to al rabi ibn Sulaiman, and al rabi ibn Sulaiman sort of published it in today's uh, words. He is the one that spread it among the students. al rabi ibn Sulaiman is the key to all the books of al-Shafi'i. All the books of the Shafi'i were uh, collected, were uh, they placed in their, their chapters, were organized by Imam al rabi ibn Sulaiman, rahimahullah. Al Imam al buwaiti is, is really given the, most of the credit for uh, the book of Al-Um. And uh, another important uh, thing about Al-Imam Al-Buwaiti is Al-Imam Al-Shafi'i made him his successor. Al-Imam Al-Shafi'i gave Al-Imam Al-Buwaiti his succession and he became, Al-Imam Al-Buwaiti became the head of the halaqa of Imam Al-Shafi'i. He became the head of his school. And in that there is a beautiful story that uh, Imam Al-Shafi'i had a beloved student to him and that is Muhammad ibn Abdul Hakam Al-Misri. And he was, his name, his name was Muhammad ibn al-Hakam of Egypt. And he, he said, Imam al-Shafi'i would say, مَا يُقِيمُنِي بِمِصْرَ غَيْرَهُ I'm, I'm in Egypt just because of him. He loved this person greatly, Muhammad ibn al-Hakam. And uh, even when, uh, when Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hakam would be sick, Imam al-Shafi'i said, I would feel sick because he's sick. This is how much he loved his students and his friend. And uh, there is a beautiful poem he said about that. He said, مَرِضَ الْحَبِيبُ فَعُدْتُهُ فَمَرِدْتُ مِنْ حَذَرِي عَلَيْهِ وَأَتَى الْحَبِيبُ يَعُودُنِي فَبَرِئْتُ مِنْ نَظَرِي إِلَيْهِ He said, my, my friend got sick and when I went to uh, check on him, I got sick because of his condition. So I, when I became sick, he came back to check on me and when I saw him well, then I became well. It's just, uh, he just showed you how the hearts were close together. And the people of Egypt, they had no doubt, no doubt that Muhammad ibn al-Hakam should be the successor. However, Imam Shafi'i got sick. He did not favor his friend over who he thought was the most worthy person of leading his halaqa. And he gave his succession to al-Imam al-Buwaiti. So that tells you how, how important and how objective and how fair Imam Shafi'i was and how he favored knowledge. He favored who really being fair over his friendship with Imam uh, Muhammad ibn al-Hakam. However, Muhammad ibn al-Hakam later on became a Maliki. Uh, he left the school of Imam Shafi'i and became a Maliki. Uh, the Buwaiti, Imam al-Buwaiti is another thing that is important to say about him is he uh, got involved into this Mu'tazila fight and he stood firm before the Mu'tazilite and he was taken to prison because of that. And one of the most beautiful stories I heard uh, and I read about that is every Friday, Imam al-Buwaiti, when it's time for Friday prayer, he would make wudu and he would wear, uh, he would wash his clothes and he would walk to the gate of the prison as if he's going to the Salat al-Jum'ah. And uh, the Sajjan, the, the warden of the prison, would say, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to Salat al-Jum'ah. He said, Irja rahim, I'll go back to your cell. He's in prison. He can't go to a Jum'ah. And he would say, Allahumma inni ajabtu da'iyaka famana'uni. Oh Allah, be a witness that I have replied and I, I had the intention to go and they stopped me. So he, you know, he felt the importance of that salah. And I thought this is really one of the most beautiful stories about this imam. Another important imam in the madhab al-Shafi'i is al-imam al-Muzni. And he was a very close friend of uh, imam uh, al-Shafi'i and an, another uh, like we said the most important one is one of the most important ones as well is al rabi ibn Sulaiman who uh, the one he, he gathered the books of al-Imam al-Shafi'i and he his title was al-Mu'addin al rabi ibn Sulaiman al-Mu'addin because of uh, he he insisted on giving adhan he was the imam of the but he would wanted to give the adhan every time because he knew and realized the importance of the adhan the importance of giving the call to prayer. So his title was al rabi ibn Sulaiman al-Mu'addin. <coughs> the uh, three books of al-Imam al-Shafi'i, like we said, al-Risala, which is the, uh, it is an important book in the usul al-Fuqah. It is important not only for the madhab al-Shafi'i, it is important for all the madhahib, for any, any student of Fuqah, al-Hujjah, uh, which has most of the Madhab al-Qadim and al-Um, uh, the uh, first version had al-Madhab al-Qadim and then the revised one has the final uh, Madhab of Imam al-Shafi'i or al-Madhab 
al-Jadid. And uh, Imam Rabi' ibn Sulaiman, like we said, he wrote most of the books and uh, collected most of the books. And he was very diligent to say what he actually heard from Imam al-Shafi'i directly and what others reported on the Imam al-Shafi'i. And all of that is well documented and well written by uh, Imam al-Rabi' ibn Sulaiman. And al-Buti put the um together and gave it to Rabi' uh, ibn Sulaiman uh, according to most scholars. Now, the fiqh of Imam al-Shafi'i, and how is it different from other fiqh, and how is it, uh, uh, what, what is unique about the fiqh of Imam al-Shafi'i, we'll try to spend the next uh, 40 minutes, inshallah, in studying that. And Imam al-Shafi'i believed that, uh, first, well, first uh, we said the importance of Imam al-Shafi'i, that he is wadi' ilm usul al-fiqh, he is the founder of the knowledge of, of uh, أصول الفقه فخر الدين الرازي هو الشافعي he said اعلم أن نسبة الشافعي إلى علم الأصول كنسبة أرسطو إلى علم المنطق وكنسبة الخليل بن أحمد إلى علم العروض he said it's, he is like Aristotle for uh, for philosophy he is the the founder and he is like the خليل بن أحمد he was uh, one of the uh, Arabic linguistics that put the rules for poetry like people knew how to say poetry before الخليل بن أحمد but Khalil ibn Ahmad came to put the methodology and to put the rules. And he, told, uh, he showed the different buhur, the different, we call, we call that in, in Arabic, buhur al-shi'r, the different uh, rhythms of the poetry in Arabic. So Imam al-Shafi'i put that in his book, Al-Risala. The, uh, the knowledge for Imam al-Shafi'i were two sections. Something he called ilm al was and another thing called ilm al khasa Ilm al it is knowledge for the common Muslims. And Ilm al khasa it is specific knowledge for the specific scholars and special people. What is Ilm al Ilm al the, the general knowledge, he said, this is something that people have, all Muslims have to know. There, it is knowledge of fiqh. For example, you should know that to pray, you have to make wudu. There is no excuse for someone to say, I don't know that. We need to know that Asr is four rak'ah. We need to know how to perform our duties. We need to know how to, how to, to, that we have to pay zakah. We need to know how to fast Ramadan. We need to know what are the things that break, that spoil our wudu. We need to know that what are the things that spoil our salah. We need to know how, this is general knowledge. This, there is no excuse for any Muslim not to know that. And this is, Imam Shafi, this is Fardain. This is Fardain. This is an obligation on every Muslim. We have to know it and we have to teach it to our children. And there is no excuse before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we don't know that. Then you come the special knowledge or the specific knowledge. And he said that is the details. The details of things. ما يخص الأحكام uh, and he said things that are specific about rulings of jurisprudence. And that is fardu kifaya. That is fardu kifaya. It is an obligation on this ummah to have a group that will fulfill that obligation. Ulama, mashayikh, you know that, inshallah, we have more of them and we're all proud of them. That they have to know, these, we have to have those. If we don't, as an ummah, we collectively are sinners. We are responsible. So if we say, we will not uh, send any of our children to learn fiqh and sharia. None of them would, would learn deen. We, were all, we want them all to be doctors, engineers, and lawyers. Then we are all sinners. The entire ummah becomes sinner. If we don't have a group of us. And how did, how, where, why did he bring that up? He said, this is in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا كَانَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لِيَنْفُرُوا كَافَّةً فلولا نفر من كل فرقة منهم طائفة ليتفقهوا في الدين ولينذر قومهم إذا رجع إذا رجعوا إليهم لعلهم يحذرون. Allah subhanahu wa taala said in Surah Tawbah, verse 122, He said the believers should not go out to fight, go out, go out to war. All of them, each group has to send a smaller group of it to go back ليتفقهوا في الدين. To learn their religion. And when the others go back to them, then they teach them about their religion. So it is an obligation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we should have a group of us that learned religion and became fuqaha in the religion. So that is the general 
ruling of Imam Shafi that each Muslim needs to learn fiqh al-ibadat, needs to know their base basics and essentials, and there is no excuse for each and individual one of us not to do it. And then each community has to produce scholars, and the entire community becomes sinner if they don't produce the proper scholar that will teach them the details of their religion. The Sources of jurisprudence or al-adilla al-fuqiyya fil madhhab al-shafi'i is put by Imam al-shafi'i himself into five categories. Five categories in there. And you'll see six of them, but I'll explain that. Uh, the first rank is for al-Qur'an wa sunnah He put the Qur'an and the sunnah as first layer. This is number one. This is where you go to first. And this is his words. He said, al-kitabu wa sunnatu إِذَا ثَبُتَتْ السُنَّةَ إِذَا ثَبُتَتْ If it is proven to the Prophet ﷺ, if it's authenticated uh, by the scholars, then الْإِجْمَعَ Then agreement. Then he said, after that, the third, قَوْلُ الصَّحَابِ قَوْلُ بَعْضِ أَصْحَابِ النَّبِي فَرَأْيُ الصَّحَابَةِ لَنَا خَيْرٌ مِّنْ رَأْيِنَا لِيَنْفُسِنَا He said, the opinion of the Sahaba about us for our affair is better than what we think about our affair. And then the fourth, he said, Khilaf al-Sahaba. See, this is the shrewdness and, and of Imam al-Shafi. He used the khilaf, he used the disagreement among the Sahaba to extrapolate and put that a source of jurisprudence in his, in his uh, school. And we'll go into that. Then, he said, finally, al-Qiyas. Finally, comparison. And uh, this is written in the book of al-Um. Now, the first source of jurisprudence in the uh, fuqah al-Shafi'i is Al-Qur'an wa Sunnah. What does it mean you take the Qur'an and the Sunnah? The, the key to that statement by Imam Shafi'i in Kitab al-Um, he said, As-Sunnah idha thabutat. When it is authenticated, the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu is really at the level of the Qur'an. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu And whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not detail in the Qur'an and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Complement the, the, complemented that, then that is an essential source. You don't dispute that, you don't discuss it, you don't argue with it, you take it from the Prophet ﷺ, like you take the Qur'an. And, and he said, and this is about a sunnah to be majmu'iha. This is the sunnah collectively, but not a particular hadith. He scrutinized hadith, he examined every hadith for what it is, and you will see that in his book. The other thing is the sunnah and the uh, Qur'an are different when it comes to aqidah. If w- somebody rejects a ruling of Qur'an, any ruling, anything in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, for example, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits you from drinking wine, right? Qamar haram. If somebody said, this is not haram, he is not a sinner, he's a kafir. He is a rejecter of the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one that drinks wine and thinks it's haram is not a kafir, is a sinner. But the one that said it's not haram, that is a kafir. So that Allah, Imam Shafi'i said, rejecting Qur'an is kufr. But rejecting solitary narrated hadith is not. Hadith al-Ahad, hadith al-Ahad only, not the mutawatir, not the mashhur. Remember when we studied the different types. Solitary narrated hadith is narrated by one sahabi, uh, from one Sahabi uh, for, and then by one Tabi'i and one follower of the Tabi'i. There is a, a solitary chain of narration. And the, the fuqaha, the jurists and the schools differed about whether to take that or not. And if someone rejects that, it's not a kafir. But if someone rejects a hadith mutawatir, Imam Shafi'i puts him in the rank of kuffar. Hadith that is completely authenticated, mutawatir from the Prophet wasallam, cannot be rejected. And then another thing is when it, if there is difference in understanding between hadith and an ayah, if there are people that, that have discussion, you always go to the Qur'an first. So although he put it in the same rack, but he clearly said you do the Qur'an, but you never leave the sunnah off. The Qur'an according to the Imam al-Shafi'i, and, and you see how, subhanAllah, and once you, the more in depth you go into the, the mind of these great imam and, and how, anal- how they were analit- analytical about their study of this, how they analyzed the Qur'an. Imam Shafi'i divided the Qur'an rulings, not the, Qur- the entire Qur'an, only the, we're talking about jurisprudence here. He said, Qur'an has am and khas. There are general and specific in the Qur'an. 
There is general and specific in the Quran. And what is general? He said general is a name that may indicate many things. For example, insan, a human being, can be a male or can be a female, can be a white person or a a darker complexed person. It can mean a rich person or a poor person. You know, insan is a general name. A human being is a general name. But khas, specific, is, is something that goes more into details and prescribe in describing something. However, that specific in itself may be general. Like you say insan, a human being can be a man or a woman. But if you say a man, that's really more specific but not very specific, right? Because a man can be rich or poor, can be tall or short, can be fat or slim. You know, so it is still not, you know, he says in Quran, the, the, the words of the Quran also can follow these rules. And how do you do that? He said the general, the general words of the Quran is three types. General words and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted a general meaning by it. An example of that is Allah khaliqu kulli shay. Allah is the creator of everything. It's a general word. And Allah means the generality of it. Allah is the creator of everything. There is no exception. Allah is the creator. When Allah said, وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ عَلَى فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا There is no, nothing that walks over the earth unless this the provision of which of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides, right? That's a general statement and the meaning in, is general. The, the meaning of that is general. But then he said there is a general words in the Quran, but it means a more specific. And in that, the ruling of jurisprudence can be extrapolated differently. And that is عام يراد به العام ويدخله الخصوص is what I said. And an example of that is we all know Surat Al-Kahf. And, and, and the, all of these examples, by the way, is from the book of Imam Shafi'i himself, the way he explained his methodology. He said when, when uh, Musa alayhi salam and Al-Khadr came to this village and they asked uh, for food, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it in Surat Al-Kahf, حتى إذا أتيا أهل قرية استطعما أهلها فأبوا أن يضيفوهما Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they came to the people of the village they asked the people for food and the people refused to give them provision or food. Now did they ask every single person in that village? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he, they, they asked the people of the village. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a general statement but the meaning of which is a little bit more specific. Although it's a general statement, the meaning of which is more specific. They asked different people, but not every and single human being that lived in that village. Why is that important in jurisprudence? He said, Imam al-Shafi'i, see how you know, intelligent and shrewd these people is. He said, that's how we extrapolate ahkam fard al-kifaya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is implicating that the, the entire village is mean and misery, right? They refuse to host these guests. Why? Because certain people refuse to host these guests. The entire village is a sinner. The entire village, athima. Because it is an obligation on every village to host the Ibn al-Sabil. Ibn al-Sabil, the passerby, the traveler, the, to, to take care of them is an obligation on Muslims, right? This is part one of the things that we spend sadaqah, charity and zakah with. So he said, if, if a people of a certain town do not have the mechanism to host Abna al-Sabi, right? To host the people that are shelterless, like Katrina victims or others, the entire city becomes sinner based on this meaning. Based on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. Because he put this general term to describe actions of the few, but the entire village became in sin. The entire village fell in sin. See the, how many of us read this verse and extrapolated all of that out of it. This is the analytical mind of these great scholars that we have, alhamdulillah. So, and then he said the third thing is a general statement, but the meaning of which is very specific. A general statement, but the meaning of which is very specific. Like what? 
الذين قال لهم الناس إن الناس قد جمعوا لكم فخشوهم فزادهم إيمانا وقالوا حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل about the battle of Uhud when Allah سبحانه وتعالى said about the believers after the battle of Uhud those who people told them that people are gathering for you people is a general word it means every human being but the meaning of that is Abu Sufyan and those with him is a very specific meaning about a very specific situation. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used a general word to describe that. And he said, it is important that this specificity of these words has to be extrapolated either from the verses themselves or from other verses that explain these verses because the best way to understand Qur'an is by Qur'an itself. And then the third thing is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then al-athar is the words of the Sahaba, especially those who were known by interpreting the Qur'an like Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And the example that he brings in that is a general, he said this is a general word, but in there there is a very specific meaning. And that uh, verse is وَالسَّارِقُ وَالسَّارِقَةُ فَاقْطَعُوا أَيْدِيَهُمَا جَزَاءً بِمَا كَسَبَا نَكَالًا مِنَ اللَّهِ Wallahu azizun hakim. The thief and the female thief then cut their hands for what they have done. A punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does every person that steal anything we should cut their hands? This verse, if somebody understands the if somebody reads that verse, that's exactly what it means. But Imam Shafi, this is Am, this is general, and there is specific things in there. What are the specifics? He said, now the ruling of cutting the hand is number one, they have, the Egypt and there has to be sirqatun min hurz. They have to break in. You can't just, you know, they have to break in. If somebody, for example, and I'm not encouraging anybody to do that, if you see a wallet on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the curbside and somebody picks it up, st they stole it and they, you know, took it and spent the money. But you, they, they, don't, they don't get their hands cut in that particular situation. They didn't break in and steal anything. The, the thieves that actually they break in, that's one of the conditions for cutting the hand. The second thing, that there has to be a minimum. There is a minimum, uh, and th that is different between one madhab and another. Before you so somebody who steals a loaf of bread, that's the really the example you see in Hollywood all the time. You know, a poor Muslim steals a loaf of bread and chop off the hand. You know, that's what, that's, that's, in faqah, in sharia is incorrect. They have to steal according to Imam al-Shafi'i himself a certain amount of gold. It has to, to be worth to a certain amount of gold, which means that they don't steal to eat, they steal to get richer. Then that is when you apply the severe punishment. They're not stealing out of necessity. And they're breaking in into somebody else's property. So this verse by particularly Imam Shafi'i said, this is a am, this is a general, uridu bihi khas, but the, the meaning of which is very specific. So not, and, and why are we going into all of this? To understand that there is this movement about Al-Quran, is we don't really need the Sunnah, we don't need the scholars, we don't need Abu Hanifa, we don't need, we, all we need to do is open a book and read. And we will take, understand, this, is, this shows us how really short-sighted uh, these, whoever says that is, and how they're really just uh, very simple-minded or viciously, or vicious intentionally uh, trying to destroy this uh, beautiful religion. It is, it is, we need the scholars who can analyze these verses, who can tell us, and who can extrapolate rulings about fiqh from that. Go to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At the time of Imam Shafi'i, there were three groups that were fighting Sunnah. And not all of them are viciously fighting Sunnah, but there was a lot of argument about the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. These three groups, one of them said that you don't need Sunnah altogether. Why? Because Allah put this book for mankind, and it is the guidance for mankind, and everything is in this book, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that everything is in, in this, is encompassed in this in book. This is the guidance for those who believe. So you don't need anything else. And Imam al-Shafi'i, he said, these are kuffar. These are not Muslims. 
and he will, uh, you know, we will see why. Because they said, that these people, and they, they're present today, by the way, they're called Al-Qur'aniyun. They're called the people of the Qur'an, which is a beautiful name for a vicious sect. And they said, all you need is understand Arabic well, and then you open the book, you read it, and you take the rulings of your uh, deen. And the hadith can be narrated by people who can make mistakes, who can forget, so you cannot depend on hadith in your religion. And that is falsehood that Imam Shafi'i completely refuted. The second group was people said, we will accept sunnah only when it's supported by the Qur'an. We accept the sunnah only if it is supported by the ruling of Qur'an. And the third group, they said, any solitary narrated hadith is rejected. You don't take any solitary narrated hadith into religion. And Imam Shafi'i refuted all of these three groups. And the way he did it is really beautiful, and I hope we have enough time to do all of that. How much time do I have? Ten minutes. Do I get five minutes, Imam? <laughs> Inshallah. Okay, let's try to do that. The first thing that Imam Shafi'i said, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala associated the believing in him with the believing in his messenger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if you believe in Allah, you have to believe in his prophet. فَآمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ النَّبِيِّ الْأُمِّيِّ and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ The believers who believe in Allah and His Prophet. He wouldn't say that if the Prophet sallallahu does not have a role. The other thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly stated that the Prophet sallallahu is the teacher, is the one that teaches our religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Rab, uh, when Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, prayed to Allah, supplicated, رَبَّنَا وَبَعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمْ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ Oh Allah, send among them a prophet that will recite your verses. If the reciting the verses and knowing the verses is only enough, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wouldn't say, وَيُعَلِّمُهُمْ and teach them the book and the wisdom and the knowledge in it. So it is important to follow the Prophet ﷺ to understand the book, to understand the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third important thing, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, now, now he's talking to people that believe in the Qur'an, but they won't reject the sunnah. He said, all this evidence from the Qur'an, he's bringing from the Qur'an the evidence to convince them that they have to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُنَ لَهُمُ الْخِيرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the book, it is not for a, a, a believer or a, or a female believer that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Prophet ordain something that they should have a choice to do whatever they want. The uh, fourth uh, thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that you call upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to judge among you that إِنَّمَا قَوْلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذَا دَعَوْا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَإِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ لِيَحْكُمَ بَيْنَهُمْ أَنْ يَقُولُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا وَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ وَمَنْ يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَيَخْشَ اللَّهَ وَيَتَّقِ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْفَائِزُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said the believers are those if they are called to Allah and His Prophet to give a ruling among them, they will say, we hear and we believe. And they are the people of success and those who obey Allah and his messenger, and they fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are the winners. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to give this message. Allah made it the mission of the Prophet ﷺ to teach people and to give them the verses, not only delivering the words, but explain the meaning. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "Ya ayyuha al-Rasul, balligh ma unzil ilayk min Rabbik, wa illam taf'al fa ma balligh tarisalatah, wa Allah yasimuk min al-nas." Deliver what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given you, has revealed to you, and if you don't, then you have not fulfilled your message. You have not fulfilled your obligation on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you from people. And that is refuting basically the argument of Al-Quran. You know, those say we will not take the Quran. The second group, uh, Imam uh, Shafi'i said, they're actually, they can divide it into two different groups. The first one that said, we will not take anything of the sunnah unless we see that the, that the Quran say it, meaning they will not take any ruling that is not actually already mentioned in the Qur'an. Well, the sunnah is 
to detail the Quran and explain it. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ they, if they, what they mean by that, we will not take that the salah, the asr is for rak'ah, then they are astray. They belong to the first group. They don't belong to the second group. But if they believe that anything in the sunnah has to conform with the Qur'an, then that argument is acceptable. That nothing in the sunnah contradicts the Qur'an, and that is a given. But not all the ruling of the sunnah should be present in the Qur'an. You understand the difference? Then the, the third group that said, we will not take a solitary hadith. Hadith al-Ahad, ghair maqbul. And by the way, hadith al-Ahad is accepted in most madahib, but some hadith al-Ahad has not been accepted. Some of the solitary narrated hadith has not been accepted. But Imam Shafi'i, he proved that you have to take hadith al-Ahad in certain positions. And he brought all these proofs from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, first, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made it clear, and the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear, that in certain conditions, you have to take the testimony of one person. The, the argument of the other group is, we, for, every, for every position, you have to at least take two witnesses. So how come for our deen, we accept only one? But Imam Shafi'i refuted that in many points. He said, in certain positions, in certain necessity, you take one. Like what? Like if there's someone is dying and there's only one person next to his uh, that dying person and he hears the will and then that one person is in, is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa taala in the book or in traveling if somebody is traveling with another person and that one person hears the will or no see what happens then that testimony is also accepted from one person. The other thing is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That he said, نظر الله عبدا سمع مقالتي فحفظها ورعاها وأجاها فرب حامل فقه ليس في فقي ورب حامل فقه إلى من هو أفقه من. Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم said he prayed to a person that hears what he said one person and he delivered. So Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم encouraged the people to deliver the hadith even if they are the only per- the only person that heard that hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And many hadith, you know, we, we, we know of, Abd, Abd, uh, of Abdullah ibn Abbas when he was riding on the mule behind the Prophet. It was only him and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some of the most beautiful hadith that we take into our religion are hadith ahad. It's not rejected by the scholars. Uh, the other thing is what happened when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got the revelation to turn the qibla. When the Qibla was to Bayt al-Maqdis, to the Jerusalem, may Allah return it to the hands of Muslims. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, turned it to Mecca. He sent one person, one person to Masjid Qiba to tell the people in Qiba to turn the Qibla around. So if they, these Sahaba that were in Qiba, they said, oh, we don't take Hadith Ahad. Go bring somebody else. They, they, did not, they should not obey that person, but they did in a, in a very important matter of religion. You see how he brings these uh, episodes. And the same thing when drinking wine was prohibited by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then uh, he said, uh, Anas ibn Malik said, I was uh, pouring wine into Talha and Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah and a man came and he said, Al-Khamr hurrinat, and they started breaking these uh, bottles of wine and they're spilling it away. One person gave them an order of religion. They didn't say, go bring somebody else. We need two testimonies. We need two people. They didn't argue with that. So he said, it is accepted by the Sahaba. He's bringing ep- uh, evidence that Hadith al-Ahad was ac- accepted by the Sahaba. He said, yet more important uh, evidence. on When the Prophet wasallam would send to a king like Qaisar and Kisra, he would send a person. One person to bring an entire ummah to Islam. If we need more than one to deliver the message of the Prophet ﷺ, then Rasulullah would have sent many people in that delegation. But he would send Duhya al-Kalbi, for example, to Qaisar. And he would be the only person that goes there and deliver the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Sahaba followed that, like we said, in many uh, different examples. But he has conditions about the solitary hadith. He said the narrator of the solitary hadith has to be a thiqa, has to be uh, well known, and has to be an intelligent person, has to be a person of uh, well, um, good memory that is known by their memory and their recitation. And the hadith has to be 
uh, not in contradiction for any other hadith that is mutawatir or of higher rank to be accepted. So he put those conditions, but he proved beyond a doubt that taking solitary narrated hadith is uh, correct and it is a true part of our religion. The other uh, aspect of al-Imam al-Shafi'i is al-Ijma' and al-Ijma' in the, uh, uh, of al-Imam al-Shafi'i is muqaddam ala al-Qiyas, is before comparison, before Qiyas. Uh, the Ijma' uh, that he took first was the Ijma' of al-Sahaba and the Ijma' of al-Ulama al-Mujtahideen. And Ijma' uh, al-Sahaba and then Ijma' the scholars. And he said he did not accept al-Ijma' al-Sakuti. We, we studied before that agreement is two types. Either all the ulama, all the scholars clearly declare that they agree on a matter, and another type of agreement that the scholars, one scholar or two scholars agree on it and the others do not object. Imam Shafi'i does not take that. He said the other scholars may not have had the chance, may not have had the opportunity, may not have known about the matter. That's why to accept agreement, make it part of religion, then it has to be a declared agreement and not a silent agreement among the scholars. The uh, other source of the Shafi'i school is the Sahaba. He took the agreement of the Sahaba as a very important source in the Shafi'i school. He said if the Sahaba agree on something, it is religion. If the companions of the Prophet ﷺ all agree on something, it is part of our religion. If a single Sahabi give an opinion and there is no disagreement, so he, he took al-ijma' al-sukuti from the Sahaba, but he didn't take it from the scholars. He said, if the Sahaba follow that opinion and there is no disagreement, even if it's given by one Sahabi, he would still take it. But if there is disagreement among the Sahaba, then he will weigh the opinions of the Qur'an, the opinions of the Sahaba by the Qur'an, by the Sunnah, and by the ruling of Qiyas. Then, uh, lastly, is the ruling of Qiyas. According to Imam Shafi'i, Al-Qiyas huwa al-Ijtihad. This is Ijtihad, is the Qiyas. And what is Qiyas? He said, the, the Qiyas, there is Al-Qiyas al-Zahir, al-Ilm al-Zahir. It is what we can understand and extrapolate. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. We don't have to go to the depth of these matters of comparison. For example, if a judge was uh, sitting on the bench and the witnesses told him that this person stole such and such and they all gave that same testimony, then when the, if the judge gave the ruling, then the judge is right. But if these people were lying, it is not, upon the, it's not the judge's fault. He said, we are not asked to go and into depth of things that we don't know when it comes to matter of Qiyas, and we have to take the apparent of what comes to us, and that is what Rasulullah وسلم, referred into by the, the famous hadith, إِذَا حَكَمَ الْحَاكِمُ فَاشْتَهَدَ فَأَصَابَ فَلَهُ أَجْرًا وَإِذَا حَكَمَ فَاشْتَهَدَ ثُمَّ أَخْطَأْ فَلَهُ أَجْرًا if, if a judge or a ruler or a jurist gave a ruling and they, made, uh, they did right, then they take two rewards, and if they made a mistake, they go with one reward. There are many types of qiyas, but uh, time is not really, and it's really uh, beautiful. Uh, I can just go over that real quickly. The first, you know, the qiyas is you, you have an origin, and you have a branch, and you're comparing the branch to the origin. You have uh, fur'i and asl, and you're comparing those. And if the branch is more obvious than the origin, then it's a clear qiyas. For example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, for the parents, وَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْفٍ Don't say uff to your father and mother. That means, by qiyas, that you can't beat them. Okay, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you can't speak rudely to them, you don't need, it is clear qiyas, that you shouldn't be beating on your parents. So, I hope everybody here does not beat on their parents. Or if the branch is the same like the origin. For example, when a slave woman, at the time of slavery, uh, commits uh, a fornication, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an said that they have half the punishment of the free people. And he said, but if you extrapolate that by qiyas into the, 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 the man, the slave, uh, the slave male, then that is equal. Because male and females are equal in sharia, unlike what Hollywood tells you. 
And he said then the other thing when the branch is less obvious than the origin, for example, the father in Islam is, uh, is obligated to spend on his children until they're able to spend on themselves. This is an obligation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَعَلَى الْمَوْلُودِ لَهُ رِزْقَهُنَّ وَقِسْوَتُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ They have to spend on the mother until she finishes the nursing and he has to spend, the person has to spend on the children. But the extrapolation that people have to spend on the kinship and their relatives, the close relatives, if they cannot provide for themselves, is extrapolated from that. Because they said the illa, the cause, for that, and this is all from Imam Shafi'i's books, he said the cause for that is uh, not only the uh, relation, not only because they cannot spend, but also the relationship, and that relationship is not only fatherhood, but it's that first kinship relationship. So if you have an aunt that is, you know, has nobody else, and she doesn't have any provision, it is your obligation to provide for that person based on this qiyas. So these are the three types of qiyas that Imam Shafi'i have placed. Uh, he said there are also certain things that you should not make qiyas on. That's why it's very important for us not to turn into jurists without studying. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that you should wash your feet when you make in wudu. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, if you're wearing a khuf, then you can wipe on it. But you cannot make qiyas and if you're wearing a hat, then you can wipe on it. You cannot, there are certain things that you cannot make extrapolation. If you're wearing gloves, you say, well, gloves like a cup, you know, I'm just wearing that in my feet and this in my hand. There is, you cannot start making extrapolations. You cannot start making qiyas. He said, don't take any nas, any text, and you say, ah, okay, this is qiyas, this looks uh, fine. He said, there are certain uh, texts that you cannot make extrapolations, and there are four important conditions in any person who wants to do this. Mastering the Arabic language, deep knowledge in Quran, deep knowledge in Sunnah, and they have to be a people of intellect and wisdom. They have to be people of intellect and wisdom. The last thing that I want to talk about tonight, and that is something unique to the Shafi'i, and it is uh, just uh, really important to uh, know that, and I will go over that real quickly, and that is an istihsan. You know, preference istihsan is taken by the Malikiyah, and it's taken by the Hanafiyah. And the Shafi'i wrote a full chapter, a full book called Ittalul Istihsan. And he said, Man istihsana faqad sharra. Innama istihsanu taladhud. Those who uh, indulge in the istihsan and the preference are uh, just playing with the religion. And those who, uh, they are making a religion on their own. And, and it is really important to know that he's not really criticizing Imam Malik or Imam Hanifa as though are people. That's why it's uh, really important. What is, what is istihsan? Istihsan is to leave comparison of the text for a different reason. And an Imam and Shafi'i, because he is writing the foundations of fuqah and the methodology of fuqah, he said, if you do anything that is outside, there is no evidence of the Qur'an, there is no evidence of the hadith, there is no athar of the sahaba, and there is no agreement, and there is no qiyas on the mosque, there is no comparison to a text, then that is not from our religion. You cannot do it outside that. And he gave six different evidence for that, and I can uh, go over that uh, with, with anybody after, but there is no really time for that. But it's important to know that the istihsan for the Hanafi madhab is really included at what Imam Shafi'i gave evidence for. Because it's the istihsan of the Hanafi is based on a text, but it takes a different reason than the apparent uh, qiyas, than the apparent comparison. And it is uh, based on the sunnah, and it is based on the book. And the istihsan of the Maliki is based on the masalih, on, the, uh, on what is benefit the Muslims. And it uh, really has a lot of conditions, and these fuqaha have some differences among them, and, and I really had prepared to go over that in details, but it is time for Salat al-Isha. So, uh, in the last uh, slide here, the madhab of Imam al-Shafi'i has spread among his students. Uh, it was really uh, had its pinnacle and peak in Egypt, and that is because of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, rahimahullah, when he ruined the, uh, the uh, kingdom of the Fatimin, of the Fatimite, the deviated group. He brought the Shafi'i scholars back to Egypt, and the main uh, group of uh, ruling in Egypt was Shafi'i. The Madhab Shafi'i is spread in Egypt and in the Valley of the Nile, in the Horn of Africa, in the Sham in general, mostly in the south. Damascus was one of the capital cities for the Shafi'is, Palestine. 
and my understanding it still probably is, is a very important center for the Shafi'i. And then the Far East, because of the traders that came out of from these areas that uh, brought the Madhab Shafi'i into the East, into Indonesia, into Malaysia, and into these islands, the Madhab Shafi'i is very prominent. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit us from our study of these great scholars. And I apologize for taking more of your time. And inshallah, if any questions, I will be happy to answer it after Salat Isha. Jazakumullah khair, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.